Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining here in the first uh, breakout session of the leading transformation track. Thanks for being here. It's a huge room and uh, in an intimate group, but uh, I'm glad you fall out. <laughs> you all found a, a way to seat, sit by yourself and all alone and isolated like you did in COVID. So <laughs> very, very good. Uh, so we can accommodate you in, in this here as well. I hope you had a great uh, experience here with the uh, opening session here with Amy. I thought it was really great to be reminded uh, of how we can be happy. It's not just all telehealth and policy and technology. There's more to life than that, even though we are here and passionate about it. My name is Christian Malaster. I'm the founder and CEO of Ingenium Digital Health Advisors, and I'm going to be your moderator here for the conference for the leading transformation track. And I'm really, really excited about this next presentation. Um, Dan Wework is a really an, an innovative uh, leader um, in, in, in healthcare in general, uh, nurse by training, a PhD, and you can see all his credentials here on the first slide. It's, it's very impressive. And he's a very nice person uh, to boot. I, I had the privilege of doing a session with him uh, last year at the conference. Unfortunately, Dan couldn't be here in person. Well, that's not unusual. And he also had a conflicting meeting that was conflicting with uh, this time slot that we had picked for him. So we have actually a pre-recorded uh, presentation. Um, it's going to have two parts. Um, he's going to introduce himself a little bit and then going to go into the bulk of his presentation. Um, then he had asked me to facilitate a conversation and I know he has some prompts for us. And so as you go in maybe in your app here and start teeing up some Q&A questions, but also then walk up, uh, walk up to the microphone um, later on and we'll have a good discussion here about leadership. But before we get started, I have one question. When you heard the word innovation, um, show of hands, what comes first to mind? Technology, process, or leadership? So who, when you hear innovation, what do you think first of? Show of hands, technology. So, okay, about a third, uh, process innovation. Who thinks of that? And leadership innovation. Uh, okay, we've got a few. Well, this presentation is about the, the latter topic. It's about the role that leadership plays in leading uh, innovation and a leading transformation. And he talks about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So, Dan, take us away for this presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan Weberg. I'm the Vice President for Nursing Transformation at Ascension Healthcare. I'm also a founding faculty member for the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine and faculty at the Master's in Healthcare Innovation Program at The Ohio State University. I'm sorry I can't be there with you, but I hope to provide a great provocation. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about leadership, the good, the bad, the ugly. So. This is gonna be an interesting session. We're going to uh, give you a, 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 about a 30 minute provocation about the state of leadership uh, and leadership science. And then we're gonna have a discussion time uh, and some tabletop activities that will be facilitated with your uh, my great co-host there. Uh, and then we're going to uh, end with some wrap up thoughts, some additional provocation, some, some uh, thoughts around where leadership is and where it's going. And hopefully we're able to address the issues uh, that surround healthcare leadership. Now, many times leadership is seen as something you learn over years of experience, which I don't discount, but there is science behind leadership as well. And in a crisis and coming out of a pandemic and many health systems, Doing and, and companies doing recovery plans and figuring out what the new normal is, uh, it's important that we understand the impact of leadership on clinical outcomes, on our own teams, and to the path of innovation moving forward. So please join me as we do a provocation. I'm excited to be here and chat with you. So let's get started. So last year I was here and we talked about the disruptions to healthcare and our path forward. I uh, I had an opportunity to keynote, and uh, this time I want to I want to just refresh our memory on a couple things, and then we're going to dive into some new leadership content here as well. So, as you all know, we are exiting an unthinkable event, which is one of the reasons why markets innovate. <clears throat> There's basically three big buckets of why systems innovate, or or companies, or or markets innovate. It's unthinkable events happen. Uh, they disrupt our entire kind of worldview. There's uh, fractures in the fault line. So cracks in the system that were already there have gotten bigger and bigger. <clears throat> and those cause us to 
uh, have to rethink what our product and services are because they're not meeting what the needs of the consumer are. And the fi final thing is running out of road. <clears throat> but right now, let's focus on this unthinkable event because it really gives us an opportunity to rethink all of those assumptions and beliefs we've had in the past around leadership and our systems. And we can disenthrall ourselves from some of those traditions as we look at the evidence, the science behind what high-performing teams are, what makes up good leadership uh, and those practices. And, and COVID and, and sort of the disruption to the world at the moment allows us to sort of break down some of those barriers uh, because it, it it moves people off of their comfort zone. And so they may be more open to change or more, uh, rethink some of the things they've done in the past. So <clears throat> unthinkable events in general uh, challenge our assumptions. So some of those beliefs we can disenthrall ourselves from. It forces people to adapt despite the restrictions. And so, uh, you know, as, as we've seen through the pandemic and now at the end, we've seen forced adaptation, whether that's the adoption of technology and telehealth as a, as a core system that sort of floundered before, um, or it's how we manage our teams as everyone moves uh, to uh, the opportunity for more flexible or remote positions. Um, and it shifts the priorities for laggards, which I think is one of the most important things. We'll talk a little bit about laggards at the, at the end, but if you go on Wikipedia, you just type in diffusion of innovation theory and, uh, and look, scroll down, look at their definition of laggard. I'm sure you know many of them. And, and a laggard is someone that will never adopt the innovation. They make up about 16% of any organization or any team that's adopting change. And uh, a lot of times we focus on them and, and when we shouldn't. And then we, we notice as the pandemic has moved forward or, or even crisis in general, how quickly bureaucracy diminishes in a crisis. And I think as innovators, as leaders, we need to take advantage of that. And so as the number of approvals and number of systems we have to go through in order to get some change done, diminishes in a crisis, we should be jumping and changing many, many things. Um, I was in a conversation recently around um, rolling out a new care model across uh, some of our facilities. And, you know, the, the conversation started coming up to say, well, you know, we can't go to the XYZ hospital because they have a lot of um, uh, travel nurses or they have, they, they're really having a lot of staffing issues and things. <clears throat> and, and I, you know, piped up and said, that's a perfect opportunity for you to go in and change something. If you have a team that is flexible, that's there on a short-term basis, go start shifting things there because as you now hire in your, your full-time team members and, and kind of rethink your teams on that unit, you're bringing them into a new culture. So the, the idea that, that a, a, a unit or, or an organization or a hospital or clinic is, is sort of in this crisis mode that's the perfect time to go reshift, rethink priorities, um, change the workflows, because as it comes out of that chaotic environment into the more uh, energetic sort of edge of chaos environment, then, um, then you have this opportunity to really renew and build something that becomes the foundation instead of trying to go um, really push against the stagnation. And we'll talk all about this complexity leadership in, in a little bit, but this is the foundation of what, what we'll be talking about today. And we know we're being disrupted. <clears throat> and there's really three big buckets of healthcare disruption happening. The first one is in education. So we're seeing the, the evidence around how people learn, the learning science has shifted, uh, the availability of free open source content, <clears throat> the creation of organizations that have democratized medical, nursing, and other healthcare professional education into online modules and, and TED Talks like uh, 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 content delivery, as well as tying it back to competency. And so most health professions now, uh, nursing, medicine, pharmacy, sort of being being at the forefront of it, is competency based education, and and not going back to uh, static tests, but under pure understanding and competency evaluation as how you move forward through a healthcare curriculum. And I think that's something that's really important. It's a shift in how we teach and how we evaluate things. It's a shift in how we think about talent as we move forward, a competency based talent structure. And so education is sort of underlying a lot of these these shifts here. The second big disruption source is workforce. And uh, I think we've all felt it, uh, especially with the move to remote work for many of the non-patient, uh, direct patient care uh, roles. And we're, we're also seeing a shift in, in those direct pa patient care roles as well. People not wanting to work 12-hour shifts in, uh, five days a week. People wanting to move around the, the country or the world to, to 
deliver the care that they know they can deliver or people moving from organization to organization with little organizational loyalty, but more focus on how they build their career and the value they add where they're at rather than staying with the organization for years and years. And so we have to keep thinking about how do we lead a distributed workforce? How do we lead a more flexible, um, transient workforce potentially? And all of those things require us to lead very differently. And, and we'll talk about it, but the leadership structures and the leadership uh, teachings that we've probably had in school or through our mentors has really been founded in the industrial revolution where people's entire life was built around the organizations they worked for because that's where the pay came from that's where the the you know there's a factory in a town and that's where you lived and that was the only source of work and benefits that that's the industrial revolution model and now work can happen almost anywhere and so how do we rethink these talent pieces? It takes a different type of leadership. It's not the, the transactional sort of industrial revolution leadership of make more widgets or show up on time, those type of things. We have to really rethink a more flexible way of leading. And then the last disruption, which we're all aware, is technology. The, the adoption of technology at your fingertips, the information, the, the, the telehealth, the, the ability to deliver services across boundaries, um, and the disruption of, of AI and machine learning and how clinicians access and deliver care is all right at the front, forefront of us. And so in the past, leadership has had the information stored within the leadership structure, and so people had to ask for it. Now information is everywhere. And so the leaders don't have information power anymore. Uh, and, and so that's just rethinking how, how leadership influences and, and what we can do to move forward through these disruptions. But all of these disruptions allow us to also lead differently, build teams differently, and move into the future. And let's just look really quickly at the evidence behind leadership and its impact on change and uh, and teams. And so, you know, this is I, I, some of these points are focused on nursing, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you right now, this is ubiquitous across every profession and every system and every every healthcare organization in the United States and beyond. Um, you know, innovation and change is really impacted by leaders. It, it's you know, leadership, uh, however that is formal and informal is the number one uh, influencer to how adoption of change happens within health systems. Now, there's been some evidence done on the nursing side to say, you know, in health systems, in acute care, uh, nurse managers or even just frontline managers in general are usually the biggest barrier to change. And it's not because they're all mean people and they, they don't want to change. It's because we set up the structure so that they're not really allowed to change. They're not incented to change. You know, you never go ask a, a frontline, you know, clinic manager or nurse manager to, um, you know, how much disruption have you done today? You ask them, how, how have you staffed? Are your patients happy? What are your HCAP scores? All the stuff that is really that status quo sort of uh, normal day to day work, that's what you hold them accountable for. You don't ask them how many times they've disrupted their nursing practice today. And so, you know, we just have to really rethink what is the role of that frontline manager and how do we prepare them to be able to change both in the moment and have a future focus on where they need to go. There's some evidence to say that how teams interact um, impacts their ability to innovate and or change. Um, and and this is simply the way people talk to each other, the way the meetings are structured, the way that uh, the interactions, those micro interactions on the day to day, the way those teams treat each other can be predictive of their ability to change. So if they're treating each other horribly, and this may sound uh, obvious, but there is evidence behind this. If they're, if they're treating each other um, not as professionals, but as uh, uh, come kind of arm's length colleagues, uh, you know, they're not really building relationships or connections there, then they're going to be a low performing team. And the ones that are able to resolve through conflict, uh, be able to embrace conflict as a source of change and innovation and, and move, the, move the solutions forward, those are the ones that are going to be more high performing. And it takes a leader to be able to be comfortable with that. You know, a lot of times as leaders, we say, well, we don't want conflict. Oh, just don't do that or just ignore that thing. But over time, those behaviors actually build up and can burst into um, dysfunctions of teams. And so we really want to be assessing and facilitating conflict as we move forward. Um, and then we have, you know, just misunderstandings of what change is. And so as leaders, we should take it on to make sure that we understand the evidence of innovation, the evidence of change, and the evidence and science behind leadership. It's not, you're not a born leader, and there's definitely ways to teach leadership and practices that are, are good leadership behaviors and bad leadership behaviors. And we have to own that, that leadership is a practice just like medicine, nursing, any other profession. And we have to own it. 
understand the evidence behind it and move forward. And if we look at that previous leadership experience and research, you know, there's a lot of problems with it. If you were to look at all of the science and, you know, in, in, in my in my PhD program, I got to read the Bass book, the Bass Handbook of Leadership, which is about 6,000 pages of all every leadership uh, uh, research ever done uh, up and through like, you know, 2005, I think. And, um, and what the pros and cons of all those different assumptions of leadership are. And you really learn a lot when you do, when you, when you're forced to read something that, that long and, and that in depth. And what, what comes out of it is most of the early leadership research that was done was done in industrial revolution organizations on white men. And so we miss an entire opportunity to understand different organizations led by different and diverse people. Um, but the previous leadership research really focused on autocracy, command and control leadership, how many widgets because you produced in what time frame. People were part of the machine. They weren't seen as people. They were seen as sort of this replaceable uh, part of the, of the machine to produce more widgets. A lot of the research in leadership is founded on the leader as an individual, as a person and a formal role, rather than the leadership that occurs through interactions and change and systems and, and, and really conceptualizing conceptualizing leadership as a, um, as an interaction and influence rather than a person behind an oak desk in an office. Leadership research also focused on how, um, how stable the teams are and stable in the way of lower conflict, you know, less turnover, some of these sort of um, stability concepts. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means um, from different lenses as well. And, you know, it really tried to leadership research really tried to come in and think about what are those, what's that one size fits all? What are those quote unquote born in traits that make a good leader? What are those one or two key behaviors that happen all the time that allow for good leadership to occur? And really kind of every leader should do these, these five things, no matter where they are in, the, in, in, in industries and, and they'll, they'll work out. So it's really about, um, it was really kind of not taking in the complexity of, of life and, and organizations and people. Uh, leadership research is very much focused on that transaction. And then the other science that's out there, and we're talking about the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, this is the ugly side of leadership that doesn't get enough uh, attention. And there's there's a significant amount of research on there about bad leadership and about um, toxic leadership. And so a lot of times, you know, you, you, we've we've all had bad leaders in the past, and we kind of brush it off as just that's is a learning experience, and something's wrong with them, and you know we'll we'll learn from it and move forward. But we have to understand that especially in healthcare, we cannot tolerate bad, toxic leadership. And you can see some of the numbers on the screen here about the impact to organizations. But there's also evidence to say that if you're a ugly leader, a bad leader, uh, a, a, a toxic leader, that you would uh, you actually increase the patient mortality rate. So the, the amount of deaths on your in your system or in your unit, in your hospital, in your clinic, in your telehealth practice, uh, will go up if you are if you are working or are a toxic leader, and it also increases burnout, suicide rate, um, turnover, workarounds, safety issues, of, and safety events goes through the roof. And so, toxic leadership should be on the top list of our quality indicators, um, not just the number of catheter acquired infections we have, but the amount of impact that a toxic leader has on organizations. And we should be assessing our leaders for toxic traits and behaviors and noting them and getting rid of them, because if they remain, you will kill patients. And so, you know, as we move forward, leadership, the good, the bad, the ugly, the ugly is poor leadership literally impacts clinical outcomes and it can't be tolerated. So let's just do a quick grounding of, of leadership research and talk about some of the big buckets here to found uh, to create a foundation for as you move forward in your conversations. So basically, there are uh, three big of, uh, there's actually four, but we'll talk about the first three. So there's there's really four big buckets of uh, of leadership research. Um, the three of them here we'll talk about, and then we'll move into complexity leadership, which is the fourth. So, you know, leadership research really started off focused on um, uh, leaders of state, uh, you know, really the Roman and, and Greek leaders originally. And it was thought to be that there, and this is actually a theory, the great man theory, which is 
what are the born in traits that someone has in order to make them a good leader. And so there's a ton of research done all the way up through the 1900s, uh, early 1900s around um, what are those traits, trying to find the traits. Now, all of this research for the most part was done on uh, white males in executive positions uh, or in uh, leadership of countries. And, and, and so it missed a big mark. Uh, and, and ultimately after, you know, hundreds of years of research and thought on this, they never found consistent born in traits that led to good leaders. So you can't be, you're not born a leader. You can actually learn leadership. So I think that's a first concept we have to understand that even if you're a bad leader, you can be, you can learn to be better. And so it's not a born in thing. The next bucket of research happened up until, you know, the 1940s ish. 1950s, maybe. And that was really focused on the different styles of leadership. And so here, this is where you're hearing things around, um, uh, I'm a democratic leader, or that's an autocratic leader, or that, uh, you know, it, 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 sort of all of those different styles. This is my leadership style. You'll hear that people say that a lot. And, you know, we, leadership style, um, the idea was that the style of the leadership, uh, could, they were looking at what styles, democratic, autocratic, whatever, it, it led to better followership. So the more people doing what the leader said. <clears throat> so again, the leader as an individual uh, and that leader, that leader's approach um, really resonating with the followers. Well, what they found in the style leadership was that it didn't matter what the style of that leader was. They could they could be you know autocratic and um, and whatever. But the success of the leader actually was on if they could find the followers that believed in that style. And so it was it wasn't about the style itself. It was could that could the leader go find the people that resonated more with being told what to do um, versus voting on what to do. Um, and so it really was that follower. Uh, that leader follower dynamic that predicted success, not the actual style that uh, that was deployed. So as long as the leader picked followers that um, liked that leader, basically, they'd be successful. And then the last bucket of research, which is newer um, uh, up until uh, the late 1900s, um, was is really around uh, transformational leadership. And then we hear this a lot in healthcare. We want to be transformational leaders. Um, and the, the premise of transformational leadership is that the leader brings their team out of darkness, helps them transcend where their current status is to be better and fulfilled and impactful. And so again, looking at the leader as all-knowing, as bringing up their lowly followers up into this transcendent state and, uh, and, 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 and then that's how organizations and teams will thrive moving forward. So generally positive, but again, you're giving one person, the leader, the power to, uh, to have to elevate the followers. And you're conceptualizing followers as this lowly group of um, unclear, unhappy uh, you know, uh, misfits that need a leader to actually bring them together to move them forward. And so again, you're, you're seeing some of these themes here. It's this person, this leader is given all of this power in these theories when in actuality, and we'll talk a little bit about this, the network of people, the interactions between the, the quote unquote followers in these theories is much more powerful than a single person. Um, and so there are some flaws with these, these research pieces. Transformational le uh, leadership is at least a little bit more positive where you're kind of helping teams grow and, and become better over time. But again, it's really conceptualized around this person as the leader rather than all these interactions and systems and networks that are happening around uh, organizations that lead to influence and leadership. So the next bucket then would be complexity leadership theory. And this is the one I, I um, you know, did, did a lot of work on and and really uh, found my my research and my writing in complexity leadership theory um, kind of has three big buckets of how leadership occurs. There's enabling a leadership, which you can see as um, people within the network that bring up opportunities and bring resources together. There's administrative leadership. And so that's that formal hierarchy. So that doesn't go away in complexity leadership. It just has less power. Um, and then there's adaptive leadership. So that's in the moment, people stepping up uh, to, to be leaders, to influence, to create change, 
um, whether they have a title or not. And so if you think of those three buckets, adaptive, enabling, and administrative leadership, that's really what makes up an organization. And it doesn't conceptualize a person necessarily being the leader all the time. It's those interactions between things and people in the network that create influence and adaptation over time. So if you're a formal leader in the system, you'd be in that administrative bucket. Your goal is to create the connections and the conversations, the conflict, the resources for all of the people in the, in, in the system or in that team to interact towards a greater goal rather than you dictating it and knowing all the answers. And so it's much more facilitation than um, dictation, basically. And so formal and informal leaderships will emerge and it conceptualizes organizations as self-organizing. It, it takes into account that people are, are individual autonomous agents, that they have history and families and, and, and unpredictable human behavior, and that they'll come and rally around different pieces of information by themselves without any input from leaders. And so, um, you know, that that's something that's very different from what the other leadership theories we talked about. And then the other piece is impact is nonlinear. And so the idea that um, small interactions uh, with people over time can create massive change. And that's really that butterfly effect. So let's dig in a little bit more to this. So in complexity leadership, there's not really a, a discussion of followership because in followership, you have to have a formal leader. Um, you know, followership isn't really, isn't really part of complexity leadership. They don't call it that. And what they, what they do say is leadership is influence and anyone can influence during any time. And it's, everyone has a choice to be influenced or not. And so it's really not about following it, blindly following some person around, but it really is choosing to buy into the vision or the, the organization goals or, or whatnot. And, you know, people always have a choice to be influenced and sometimes they choose not to be influenced <laughs> and, and that's fine, but that's also an expression of leadership. So leadership lives everywhere within the organization. Um, what followership does is it creates an unequal power dynamic. And, you know, what, what formal leaders need to understand um, is that the network is much more powerful than any formal leader. Now, I'll give you an example. So when I was at a large integrated health system on the West Coast, we had about 60,000 nurses that worked for us across uh, multiple states. And if we wanted to create a change, let's say institute a new infotainment system within our hospital that created some disruptions to the workflow of those nurses, no matter how many vice presidents, presidents, CEOs, COOs came down and said, this is the way, um, that network of nurses could reject that technology and make sure it sat in a drawer uh, or never got used um, very easily. And they didn't have any necessarily any formal leadership in that space. They just chose not to use it. And so that's a, a lot of power. So those 60,000 nurses could overpower any directive from a single individual leader. And so we have to, as leaders, we have to understand that, that the network can overpower any of our decisions or our decrees, whether that's leaving, which we're seeing with our healthcare workforce, they're deciding that I'm not going to be influenced by this direction. And so they leave um, or or, or they decide not to use something, or they decide to change the workflow themselves. They can power all of that stuff despite a single formal leader. And so we have to just reconceptualize leadership. So it shifts this idea of leadership from leadership as being a, a directive giving or, or owning something or, or being accountable for something to building relationships. And so it's really that relationship building that allows us to influence people. And so as leaders in complexity science, and as we move forward, the good side of leadership is the more relationships we build, the more we can provide uh, trusted information back and forth between individuals, uh, the more we'll be able to influence uh, uh, actions over time. The other piece of complexity leadership is it conceptualizes this idea of stability and chaos on two ends of a spectrum. And uh, you really want to be far away from stability. So all those other leadership theories really focused on stability, being uh, no conflict, running the day-to-day, -day, you know, keep the engine humming sort of analogies. But in complexity leadership, the idea is to move closer to this idea of chaos. Now, when you think of chaos, if you if you haven't studied complexity leadership, chaos is like, well, I don't want chaos. That's when everything's on fire and I can't do anything and, and nothing's working. 
you don't want to be that far into chaos, <clears throat> but you do want to you do want to have this edge of chaos, which is where energy is really high, where you may not know all the answers to what's going on, but you're and but you're a little bit uncomfortable and you're moving forward towards uh, it, it, you have a lot of energy in the system. And so that's really where people are excited, where they're willing to try things, where they're willing to adapt to change, um, where they're willing to kind of lean into the unpredictable uh, solutions or un unpredictable problems that are happening in the moment. And so you really want to be on that edge of chaos. So what is chaos? Well, chaos is really three big conceptual pieces. One is small changes to initial condi conditions can lead to unpredictable outcomes. So um, this is that idea of the butterfly that flaps its wings and creates a hurricane and wherever across the world. Those little micro interactions between people, whether it's a formal leadership role or, you know, clinicians uh, together on a unit or a patient and a, and a provider through telehealth, th these little interactions can lead to massive change. That one conversation you have with somebody can lead to them rethinking how they practice or how they conceptualize a disease state. And so really looking at and focusing on those micro interactions, those, those ways we talk to each other, the ways we relate as the source of leadership influence, not these big decrees and big projects and big deadlines, and those type of things. The next thing is uh, chaos is really is really just a lack of predictability. And so um, you can't uh, necessarily apply known solutions to known problems when things are in chaos. You have to look for patterns, patterns of behavior, patterns of interaction, patterns of outcomes. You can look at the... Um, you can look at the, the pandemic as a way where we saw patterns over time, and that's really how we led for it. We can never predict how many people are going to get sick on what variant at any given time, but we could look for patterns. And at, over time, we could see those patterns and what influenced them or not and make decisions based on the patterns of behavior. And that's what really uh, complexity leadership is all about, looking for patterns and, and managing to those patterns, not to those um, known, known issues. And then the last piece is patterns can be determined, but the specific data points can't. So sometimes you have to lead towards an outcome and the process to get there is really messy. And so you can adapt in that process over time, but that outcome may be, provide that level of stability where you're not, you know, you're not totally into chaos. Um, you're sort of on that edge. So let's look at a couple examples um, in, uh, in organizations and in nature that around chaos. So you know, chaos is everywhere. And this is really where it's conceptualizing complexity leadership that the idea that stability is bad <clears throat> because the only things that are stable are rocks and dead things. And in organizations, if organizations are a living, a living thing, then we want to have that natural sort of ebb and flow and movement uh, of energy that moves uh, uh, through through people and through interaction. So a couple of chaos examples. One is the beating heart. Um, you know, stability in the beating heart is asystole, and that is bad. That's death. Obviously, that's when the heart stops beating. Um, and when the heart has actually some of the most energy, which is too far into chaos, is something like ventricular fibr fibrillation. But the edge of chaos is really around the normal sinus rhythm. <clears throat> the normal sinus rhythm isn't 60 beats a minute consistently. It's 61 and 65 and 52. And it varies, you know, five to 10 beats at any given moment. It's never just 60 all the time, despite what our charting says. So that variability is actually a sign of a healthy heart. The more it gets to stable beats, like 40 beats per minute, uh, that would mean that the heart has electrical conductivity issues and it's actually dying or those, <clears throat> those pieces are dysfunctional. And so the closer it gets to stable rhythm uh, where, where there's zero variability, the worse off that heart's going to be. And the same thing happens within your organization. If you have zero conflict on your unit <clears throat> where no one is ever upset about anything, you're closer to stability than you are towards change and innovation. And so you really want to have those discussions, those con facilitating those uncomfortable situations, because it adds energy into the system. That variability of positive and negative conflict and, and resolution actually is a healthy team. Weather patterns are also a, a, an idea of chaos. The way we predict weather patterns and the Lorenz equation uh, is, is a big piece of that. You can see when we predict hurricane paths that there's variability in where they're going to happen, and that's good. <laughs> that, that means that it's unpredictable. We can look at patterns to figure it out, but we can't ever know exactly where that hurricane is going to go. And then we already talked about the coronavirus piece. And then let's just look at the opposite of chaos. So people are like, well, I like stability. I want to be, I want to maintain the status quo. We're just trying to deliver care. 
Well, the opposite is death. And so if you are not moving, if you are not allowing conflict to occur, if you're um, not allowing flexibility and variability to happen within um, some of your interactions uh, within your teams, then you have stability. Stability really means lack of diversity, stagnation, and rigid structures that control information and decision-making that don't allow people to adapt in the moment. And over time, if people aren't allowed to adapt in the moment, they become irrelevant or their, their current practices become uh, unsafe because their environment and the science and everything else around them moves, but they've chosen not to, not to change their, their practices for the last 30 years. Um, that's where you really get into trouble. And so you don't want to have rigid structures. You want to allow for this adaptation and good variability to happen because that's the healthy, that's what a healthy team looks like. And so it's it just reconceptualizing this idea of what a good leader is um, and how they move forward. And sometimes it feels like this, but, uh, but that's okay. It's okay to butt heads. It's okay to have conflict. And as we conceptualize leadership moving forward, it's really about uh, facilitating this conflict to occur to allow uh, the, the, the team to move forward. So let's look specifically, and then we're going to pause and you're going to have some conversation around this. Again, I'm your prov provocateur. But let's talk about what are some of those key leadership behaviors um, to lead into the future. The first one is we really got to build connections. And so connections are the fact that I, I know who you are and I can reach out to you. That's simply it. I'm connected with you in some way. The next big piece of that is you'll have a lot of connections, but you'll only, only have a few relationships. And so you really want to cultivate these relationships. And the difference between a connection and a relationship is a relationship is when you share trusted information between, uh, between people or between uh, uh, groups. And so that trusted information allows for more informed decision making, for influence to occur. And so you really want to cultivate these relationships in order to influence across systems inside and out. Um, in order to, to, to lead forward. The next piece we talked a lot about, which is live on the edge of chaos. Crisis is the exception, um, not the norm. And that occurs when you allow some for adaptation and variability in the moment. When you have rigid structures that are in place until they break, that's when you have crisis. What you want to do is have less rigid structures that allow for adaptation over time that then build up to people shifting, uh, you know, uh, shifting it, it, to adapt quicker than waiting for something to break and then having to run around and, and reform uh, in the moment. And so embrace the messy and look for those patterns of behavior ahead of when uh, the crisis occurs. And then finally, it's, uh, you have to go around and systematically dismantle stagnation. And so you can do this very simply, be transparent, share relevant information with your team members. Don't hide it behind, well, that's confidential. And well, we can't talk about that. And you know, you know, if I shared the financial situation, we would all be in trouble. And all of those things uh, restrict information into people who are making decisions. And when you have a lack of information, you make things up. That's where rumors come from. That's where maladaptation of teams and, and interactions and conflict come from. So you wanna be transparent, share information, and set clear priorities and expectations. Um, you know, what are the guardrails that people can bounce around in in order to solve the problem or move forward or deliver the care? That's really dismantling that, that stagnation. Because the closer we are to stagnation, the more we are going to get into trouble. So you've got a little baseline of traditional leadership theories, uh, of complexity leadership theory, of this idea of um, formal leadership, maybe not having as much power as we conceptualize. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the good, the bad, the ugly within, uh, within leadership science. So I'm going to pause here, allow you guys to have some conversation. And at the end, we'll come back for a few minutes of wrapping up of how do we move forward past this. Great. Well, thank you, Dan. And uh, if you can rewind the video just uh, uh, 10 seconds on that previous slide, I think that would be good to have up here on the screen. So uh, obviously, we did not envision such a big room here. We, I was hoping for a little bit more intimate setting, but uh, really want to facilitate here a conversation because one of the benefits of being at these conferences is hearing from other people what's opening up for them and what they have seen. And so 
Um, so if, if you have uh, some, some ideas or if there's some Q&A uh, from the virtual audience that you want to uh, put a provocation uh, of, uh, of your own uh, in, into the chat. So uh, definitely Dan uh, kind, of, uh, kind of dismantled some of those traditional views of leadership that it's around one person and there's followership and it's really more about creating an environment, creating a system. Um, so, um, so, so I, I just thought uh, that um, uh, I would like to hear uh, from from individuals here what what opened up for you. Do you agree uh, with uh, that? This is the role of leadership in the future, and this is how you are seeing it being uh, going forward in your organization. Or second option: Do you agree? But you think this is never going to work in healthcare. This is healthcare is different. It's right. It's uh, more more uh, more more um, important, or it's it's difficult because we have patient care and we're not just creating some some widgets or providing some random service. So, um, does anybody feel compelled to to uh, share with your perspective on what's opening up from you from the provocation that Dan put out here for us? Yes, if you could walk up to the microphone so that the uh, uh, virtual assist, uh, virtual participants rather, could uh, also. Thank you so very much for volunteering, for being the first speaker. So that's always. <laughs> Got to get it going. Uh, Rebecca from Baltimore. Um, I thought it was fabulous. Um, I love that idea of complex leadership and I love chaos. We were laughing over at our table because telehealth is constant on the edge of chaos, right? And you just have to get used to things not being perfect and let's move to better and let it go and go and let it go and go and keep your team engaged in that. I think it's interesting on the building connections, um, especially in this time of COVID, doing that virtually. And we've tried so many different strategies. I would just be interested in what some other leaders have done to build connections with their virtual teams. Our team doubled during COVID and most folks we've seen twice in two years um, in person, but we feel very close to. And so I was just interested to see uh, what so, some folks did. So you're saying that you uh, maybe we need to challenge that paradigm where we had that paradigm that we need to have in-person connections in, in order to build functioning teams. That oh, we yeah. Feel close yeah, to. I totally disagree with it, that right and, and now structure. you're saying that no it, it can't you can create mm -hmm. if you're conscious about it uh, and, and that's what right chaos gave birth yep. to this new insight uh, into that uh, very good thank you rebecca yeah so some ideas you know, i was going to ask a question initially but i can respond to her question um my name is alfred atanda i'm coming from wilmington delaware um i'm an orthopedic surgeon and uh you know when the pandemic hit us uh we we went to all virtual just like many other people did and unfortunately in our our world you know everything as you know in surgery starts very early and i we realized that actually with the pandemic and doing everything virtually made it easier to get a lot of participation and buy-in from all the different surgeons in the department the pas the nurse practitioners because you can do all the meetings at home you can do it on the treadmill you can do it in the car you can do it wherever you were um you know our meetings <laughs> they start at 6 15 every single day of the week and you know i i can tell you none of my partners are here i, I kind of can't stand it but um the pandemic actually allowed for more people to participate because you know i i live about 40 minutes from the hospital and a lot of times i would miss the in-person meetings but now that it's virtual um, I still I still miss some of them, but um, I do attend a lot more of them. So that was just our experience. Um, we thought it would kind of pull us apart, everybody being on their own, but it actually helped. So direct follow-up question to that then, how do you see has your leadership or the leadership in your, in your team changed and adapted to allow for that kind of uh, change? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, I mean, everything comes from the top down specifically in our world. It's very, very hierarchical. And um, our chairman actually bought into um, the whole virtual transformation of our department, which was very helpful. Um, I mean, he himself um, does everything virtually and, um, you know, leading by example, you know, if he's there and, and he's on time for all the morning um, lectures now that they're virtual, it kind of encourage other people to do that but um i do in the vein of what we're talking about i do think a lot of that comes from the top down you know if the leader sets an example of everybody being present and being available um, then that trickles down 
um, to the masses. Very good. Thank you. And then did you? Have another I, I did have a comment. Us? Yes, <laughs> I'm sitting up here yeah. rambling yeah. on. So, you know, my initial comment was going to be that you know I, I wholeheartedly agree with with a lot of what was presented today. But you know, at least in you know the medical training world with with, with medical students and residents, you know, it's so ingrained in our culture um, that leaders are people who are old, people who have been around, people who have been you know having formal roles. And you know, I'm a relatively young surgeon and, and never really thought of myself as a leader. Um, but really challenging the status quo and, and, and pushing innovation is something that I've tried to do. But when you work at a large academic health system, I mean, I think of it more as like a cruise ship instead of a speedboat, right? You know, a cruise ship it takes a tremendous amount of energy to change course, but it can also weather any storm, you know, because it's big, it's foundational, it has a lot of resources um, where the small, nimble, innovative things can, you can have pilots and do different ideas um, and do all sorts of stuff very quickly um, but you don't have that same foundation and security to weather all the ups and downs of the healthcare system. So I struggle with that because I tend to be young and innovative and doing telemedicine and virtual consults and all the other things that we don't typically do. Um, right. But sometimes it's just easier to go with the status quo um, right. and, and just go with what you know and what you've always been trained to do. And it's threatening to the established leadership that grew up with this old paradigm of leadership model. Right. and and. It's, 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 it's difficult to change and to shift in that world that you're more of an enabler rather than the people that people look up to to make the final decisions. So yeah. very, very good point. Thank and you. I think, yeah, we're, COVID did not just only open up the opportunities for telehealth, but also the virtual care. Uh, actually, directly related to that, I have a question. So uh, we're working with a health center um, and uh, most of the administrative leadership team is working virtually. And Dan kind of hinted that uh, in one of the comments here in his presentation as well, but obviously direct uh, to patient primary care um, and, and behavioral health, uh, we still need people to be in the office to check people in and do that. And so um, have you experienced kind of a little bit uh, disconnect maybe between the people that are required to come in and then the people that can stay home? And how are you addressing that? And maybe that's too specific a question for the audience here, but somebody, Rebecca, do you have a thought on that? Or is it not a, not a, is it presented differently? Is it not becoming a problem in, in that organization? If you could walk up to the microphone, so because we have virtual participants, thank you. So it's been interesting to hear our young faculty say, but if some people are at the meeting and I'm not there, am I missing an opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Or they're scared they're not gonna be seen as leaders. And so I think it's really important for leadership to lead the way here and say you can be just as much a leader in your pajamas in your bedroom if that's where you're most productive and you can inspire your team versus being in the boardroom in a suit and tie. Now there are times when you need to be on site, I get it, and especially you know patient care and all that, but um, I think if we can lead the change and model the change mm -hmm. so that people feel safe okay. to embrace the new norm, then you're gonna you're going to attract and keep people in your organization because other organizations are letting them be where they're most productive and letting them work in the manner that is most productive for them. Right? We have tons of talented faculty who don't want to come back from maternity leave or who have felt the balance of work and home and don't want to come back. And if you can't offer that and support that, then you're going to lose out on top tier talent. And that is across the organization at all levels. Thank you. Um, and I think you gave also a perfect answer to the question that came in here through the uh, uh, online form. I read it out. Uh, healthcare has always been dynamic, so one won't expect leadership to be dynamic, but it is often stated we've always done it that way. And what are the best steps with efforts to lead staff with this kind of mindset? And I think it's role modeling it, it's supporting it, um, and it's also just understanding that this is the new normal, right? Um, when we talk about telehealth, we have the MWELs and Teladocs and, and the, the Walmart Health and Amazon Virtual Cares that are modeling that behavior, that it works. They figured it out because they live in a different cultural environment. And similarly, especially in a workforce shortage environment, uh, um, staff will vote with their feet. They will, they will go for the employment that offers them the flexibility that they desire. And some people will uh, desire coming into the office. They, 
didn't want to have that chaos at home, but some uh, will want to do that. And so having that flexibility and supporting it. And I think leadership is always about modeling behavior. And so it, modeling relationships. Good. Um, one more question here. I'm wondering what we think people need to be in office to check patients in. Couldn't we collaborate think about this role? I was thinking the same thing <laughs> as I was saying it out loud. Yes, um, a patient check-in uh, can be just done virtually as, as well, if that is conducive to the role. I mean, uh, so yeah, in, in a, uh, I think we're really at the cusp of really rethinking healthcare delivery um, in many areas. Telehealth and telemedicine is one thing, but all the peripheral processes of uh, rooming a patient and, and uh, the follow-up process, all of these things are moving more and more into a care at a distance world. Good. In the interest of time, I want to tee up here now the uh, concluding uh, nine minutes that Dan has prepared for us to kind of bring us home with this pr presentation. So thank you for this discussion. Thank you for your contributions and uh, also online. Thank you so very much. Um, if we can switch over to the uh, second video. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I'm sure you had some amazing conversations and, and again, I'm sorry I can't be there, but I, I think you've, you've probably talked about, well, this doesn't make any sense to me or I'm never changing or wow, this is just like opening my eyes and I, I can't wait to learn more about complexity leadership. So um, let's talk a little bit about some of those tips to move forward as we can reconceptualize what leadership is and how we lead forward into the future. So there's a great book by uh, uh, authors Tid, T-I-D-D, -D, and Besant, B-E-S-S-A-N-T, called Managing Innovation. And they it's just a really great idea, uh, 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 textbook around change and, and innovation and, and how organizations inside and outside healthcare do that. And they've really come up with three big reasons, or, or sorry, four big reasons why organizations reject change. One is it's not our business. So there, we don't want to expand into that service line or we don't want to adopt that thing. And, you know, I think about Amazon, you know, they sold books. And if they said, we're only going to sell books, they never would have become the company they are. So you have to take strategic risks that may be outside of your current business. And in healthcare, you know, part of that is actually telehealth. You know, we've been a in-person delivery system forever. It's not our business to move into tele care. Um, you know, th those are things you'll hear. And uh, really, that's a reason. It, it, it's an excuse for not changing. And it's led to um, organizations being irrelevant. The next one is we're not cannibals. Well, you know, if we do telehealth, we'll have to stop our in-person XYZ thing. And so that we'd be eating our own revenue streams. And we can't do that. Well, Kodak said that at one point and um, when digital film was coming out and they still wanted to produce physical film and well, Kodak ended up losing that game and having to close down a lot of their film um, uh, uh, manufacturing systems because digital film was the way forward. So don't be afraid to stop doing something as you move forward into the future. It's okay. Um, in order to create innovation, you have to stop doing other practices. You can't just pile on. And so be okay being a cannibal of some of your processes and your services in order to, be in order to move into the future. It ain't broke, so why fix it? <clears throat> you know, we saw that with the, the Uber, Lyft versus taxis. Well, taxis aren't broken. We're never fixing those. Uh, meanwhile, every consumer is like, taxis are gross. They're slow. They yell at us. We don't want to do that. Um, I'll never ride in a, in a stranger's car. And so we have, to, we have to think about this. If we're saying it ain't broke, so why fix it? That's a, a cue to you that you're in stagnation, that you're not moving forward. And so you have to really think about that and, and, and address it. And maybe this is a source of conflict you can use it to move forward in innovation. And then the last one is really the statement I hate the most, which is complacency, which is, yeah, we're doing okay. Yeah, you know, last month we had only three falls. It's fine. You know, it's not a big deal. Um, or, you know, we're, we're fine. We're, you know, our patients sort of like us. They give us like a five out of 10. It's fine. Um, you know, that's mediocrity. I hear this a lot in, in professional schools. Hey, we, you know, our board pass rate is great. Um, we're doing fine. And, I'm, you know, that, that's just one measure and it's not the bar to be measure yourself against. If you're, if you're hearing this happen, we need to set higher expectations for people to move to. So these are reasons why we need different leadership is because organizations are set up to reject change. 
And then a lot of people in the innovation space are like, well, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty with innovation. It creates chaos. Yes, it does. And that's where leadership comes in. You can control all of this stuff. It's directly related to leadership. And so leaders create certainty in the outcome, not necessarily the process when it comes to massive change or, or innovation change, because you may not know what the process is and it has to be able to adapt over time, but you know what you're trying to get to. You can see that North Star where you're headed to. And so leaders create that certainty in the outcome, but allow variability in the process. And so what are some of the top causes for innovation uncertainty? And this is all leadership stuff as well. You can take this home as, you know, if you're a change leader, which many of you are, you, you can, um, you know, focus in on a few of these things. But, you know, when we have no limits to the number of innovation projects that are happening, or we don't have good selection criteria, or we're treating innovation as sort of a side gig. Well, that team gets 5% of their time to innovate. We're, we're creating a lot of uncertainty and what, what are the expectations of these change efforts? When you say anyone can innovate and we love all these great ideas, they're not targeted. And so you'll get a, a idea box uh, or, or ideas from your team about stuff that's totally irrelevant. You wanna create constraints. You wanna create criteria. You wanna create decision matrices in order to focus the energy of innovation, change, and ideation for your teams. If it's blue sky all the time, you have lots of ideas that will never be implemented because they're not relevant to the focus areas or where the resources are directed within organizations. And so really understanding structure to the innovation process to balance that chaos crisis and stability and stay right on the edge. And then, you know, just looking at a couple secrets of the successful uh, leaders across time, hamster wheeling is one of the big pieces here. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, a lot of my students in the master's in healthcare innovation program want this, their idea to be perfect. Then they want to hire developers and build this app. And I said, do it with paper, do it with a post-it note, um, smoke and mirrors it for a little while and see if it works before you invest. And so this minimum, this idea of minimum viable product, um, or putting the hamster in the wheel to get it moving is, is really important. The next big piece is taking a systems view. Fix the system, not the feature. So when you have issues within uh, your practices and uh, a lot of people wanna go, well, you know, the Pixis doesn't do X, Y, Z, so we're just gonna go fix the Pixis machine. <clears throat> Usually, or there's a medication error. We just got to, you know, if we just do education on medication errors, everyone will stop having medication errors. Instead of thinking about what are the systemic factors that are leading to those pieces. And so really zooming out, seeing the system. You need to own your own risk tolerance. And so if you don't like disruptive change, own that and be communicative about that within your team so that they know and that they can help you through that. Um, you know, it, 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 the worst thing is, is I, you know, being told that you love innovate or telling people you love innovation and in the back of your mind, you hate change in any way, you know, just, you have to have those conversations in order to move forward. So own your risk tolerance and be um, uh, transparent about it. And then the last piece is reassess your priorities frequently. Many times we have these five-year strategic plans, three-year strategic plans, that, that's too long. In, in a world where things change in minutes, in hours, um, you, you need to be reassessing at least quarterly uh, what your priorities are and move forward differently. These five-year strategic plans are irrelevant. You can have five-year desired big bucket outcomes, North Stars to go to, that's fine. But having specific priorities that are unchangeable for any more than 12 months um, is going to lead to a stagnation environment within your organization. So what are some of the principles you could do? I mean, it's all about information flow and decision making and transparency. So what if you cut down on your email communication and started talking to people at physically or using uh, instant communication methods, such as Slack and Teams and Google and whatnot? The more you can provide instant answers and, and, and uh, information that's shareable and searchable, the more you're going to have a nimble organization that can find information quickly, make decisions off it. That can also be done through daily huddles. And then, you know, this is one that's a little bit disruptive, but what if every uh, quarter you just deleted every meeting off your calendar and started over and stopped going to the ones that were irrelevant? Because when you show up, it provides um, the perception of value of these meetings. And sometimes these meetings need to be moved. <laughs> they, they're not valuable. And so leading, leading with where you put your time and influence is more appropriate. And then the last thing I'll leave you with here uh, is... Don't worry about the laggards. We talked about this a lot. You know, the last piece of, of information for a, a leader moving from the ugly to the good would be 
many people spend 90% of their time on the 16% that will never change, those laggards. We should be spending all of our time on the 84% of people that will. And so if you're hitting your head against the same person or the same issue over and over and over again, stop focusing on it. Focus on the people that are starting to adopt it and move forward. And then you'll be leading like a complexity leader. You'll be leading on the evidence of innovation and the science of leadership. And you'll be moving from the ugly leader to the good leader. I appreciate your time. I hope you, this was valuable and have a great rest of your conference. Don Berwick, the founder of the Institute of Healthcare Improvement always uses this quote, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So if you want to change the outcomes of your organization, the rate of innovation, the engagement of the staff, you got to look at what systems do you need to change? What processes do you need to change? What incentives do you need to create or change or adapt? So with that, I wish you a great rest of your day here. Uh, lunch is being served for the next 45 minutes in the exhibit hall next door. We'll be back for a luncheon keynote here at uh, 1 p.m. And then in the afternoon, we'll have some additional breakout sessions uh, again that in your program or as was mentioned this morning in the app, maybe the latest location of the breakout rooms. With that, thank you so very much.